welcome to another episode of the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast. My name is Matt Welch, being joined by Devin Hassan and Brian Murphy. For the third consecutive Thursday, guys, we are coming to y'all from Kelly's Craft Tavern out here in Frisco. Um, if you've been listening to the podcast these last couple weeks, we've been doing some remote episodes out here and espousing the greatness of Kelly's Craft Tavern, whether it is the uh, the encyclopedia's worth of, of craft beers at their full-service bar or just the, uh, the, uh, the smorgasbord of made-from-scratch food, be it barbecue, Tex-Mex, or just some good old all-American classics. That is uh, Kelly's Craft Tavern located at Preston Ridge on the west side of Preston Road, just north of 121. And that's where you can find us on this fine Thursday afternoon as we are here to talk some hoops, guys. The uh, the first round of the high school girls basketball playoffs are in the books. It was a busy start to the week. I believe we all had games Monday and Tuesday for us to cover. Um, so yeah, we're going to quickly uh, just kind of go back and look at some of the happenings from that first round. And then later on in the podcast, we will bring on Frisco Liberty girls head basketball coach Ross Reedy. And then after Afterwards, just give a cursory preview at some of the action on the boys' side of things. The boys' basketball playoffs begin uh, next week. So um, let's see. So, um, yeah, the first round is in the books. So uh, what was uh, – Brian, Devin, what was um, – from what you saw or just what happened in your coverage area, what was kind of the uh, the biggest takeaway from what you guys saw coming out away from the, uh, the first round of the high school girls' basketball playoffs? Frisco Memorial losing to Denison. Fairly surprising um, result. <laughs> yeah, and that one – so that one was kind of strange because they played that one Tuesday night. They played that <coughs> one at Denison. Uh, Memorial's the two seed in 9-5A. Denison, obviously, the three seed. Um, but Coach Vaughn, um, second-year head coach at Memorial, former varsity assistant at First School Liberty. So, Ross Reedy, I'll, I'll ask him, you know, coming up on the next segment what he thinks happened with Memorial. But, um, you know, I, I actually spoke to Coach Vaughn Monday night heading into the Lone Star North game. Um, she was coming in to a little <coughs> scouting as Devin is, is dying uh, right yes. in front of us. I hope you're okay. It's right. uh, early in the podcast. <laughs> you're going to be dying, Devin. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll make it through. I'll power through. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, but, yeah, so then so she wanted to make sure that they play Tuesday night and not Monday. So she had one player um, in a volleyball tournament that she needed, uh, but she wouldn't be available Monday. She also had two other player starters and heavy contributors out sick over the weekend. She didn't want them playing Monday. So she really wanted to play Tuesday. So then, therefore, she picked the day. Denison picks the venue. There was, they couldn't really decide on any other midway point. So they were like, why not? We'll play at Denison. And I really didn't think, you know, that – that wouldn't be an issue. And I thought Memorial, um, alongside the, the Liberty Lovejoy matchup, I thought those were two slam dunks for District 9-5A. Yeah. And, boy, I was wrong because <laughs> Denison wins 58-45. Because it's one of those where, like, you just kind of take it for granted after you see how that first night went between those two districts, and you have, like, the four seed from 9-5A, Frisco Centennial. They beat the district champion out of 10-5A and by 21 points. I called points. that on, la- on the podcast uh, on Monday. So you just kind of see it. You're thinking, like, okay, then it's going to be a layup for Memorial and whatnot, just given what they had shown this season. I mean, that's as, about as talented a team as there is in the Frisco area. But, yeah, it's not just the fact that they, that they lost in the first round. It's that they lost by 13 points. And whether it was, you know, the fact of just playing in Denison, I know we – you know, we've talked in the past about how tough that can be just from a football standpoint, and perhaps that uh, that kind of carries over from an atmosphere standpoint to the basketball court. But um, yeah, a very uh, a very surprising end to the uh, to the season for the uh, for the Lady Warriors. But nevertheless, it's still a, a very young team and a team that still has a very promising future ahead. Um, let's see, Devin, where did you uh, where did you land on? I guess your takeaways from the first round. Uh, you know, I think I might have seen I, I saw the top two candidates to come out of Region Two in Six A. Okay, um, I saw Plano. On Monday, when they played Rowlett, uh, very methodical, just thorough game. I mean, it's, you know, they, they were the favorite, obviously, as the champion going against the fourth seed. But um, they just, they took control from the start. They looked really good. They looked really poised. I mean, I should say, I shouldn't say they looked for the, good from the start because Coach Belcher would come back on me because they were sloppy at the beginning. And he said, he said, you know, we all have nerves. And even though these girls have been there before, there's always those first round jitters um, in the opening playoff game. Uh, but, you know, outside of that, uh, they, they, were really impressive. Michaela Eddins was strong. Santa Murphy Sowers, uh, you know, Maggie Robbins just so, does such a good job running that offense, mm-hmm. uh, running that team. Really, uh, you know, Kyler Hardy, who I guess comes off the bench, you, yeah. you know, she she had a very very strong game with eleven points. So you know, they they brought in their backups. There really was no drop off, and uh, you know, so they they're right where they 
thought they'd be in terms of going to the second round. Uh, Saxy and Allen on, on Tuesday was, um, again, we talked about last week. I thought, you know, if Allen, if the Allen of the first half of the district season shows up, For this sure. is going to be a battle. And, um, I, you know, it seemed like it, at first they jumped on Saxy early. Uh, they were just dominating on the glass. They, they had that size with McKenzie yeah. Worm and, and whatnot inside. Uh, and even, uh, you know, Rylett's post, they have two very good post play, players in at L Tech and Elizabeth Woods. And I, you know, I lost count of the number of block shots that they had in the first quarter alone. Yeah. They just actually could not get off. Worm was quite the rim protector. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, but Saxy settled down. Uh, they got back to playing their style of ball. Uh, it was still a close game. I mean, this was a back-and-forth game. Allen led at halftime. Uh, they were up by one going to the fourth quarter. Uh, but Saxy um, put it together down the stretch. They had to put together a 12-0 run in the fourth quarter. Uh, really did it from the free throw line. I mean, they went 12-15 at the line. So, I mean, that's, you know, 80% shooting is going to, at the free throw line, is going to allow you to pull away. Their defense was due. They held Allen without his field goal for five minutes uh, during that stretch in the, uh, in the fourth quarter. You know, so from watching this sexy team all, all season long, uh, it, it's a very sexy like effort because that's what they do is their defense is first and foremost. Mm-hmm. And uh, once they were able to kind of neutralize and even things up on the glass, uh, they were able to kind of exert their will. Uh, you know, so th- there's a prospective third round meeting between Saxy and Plano oh, yeah. uh, that's on the horizon. But, um, you know, they still have challenges to get through first. For sure. Uh, you know, I mean, Saxy in particular it plays a very interesting Waco Midway team who was able to beat Horn um, on Tuesday, uh, you know, or Monday, a good Horn team. Uh, Jasmine Shavers went off for 27 points, but it still wasn't enough. So really interesting to see how that game turns out. But, you know, if you kind of look at that region as a whole, even on that side of the bracket, uh, you know, Cy Ranch, the 14 6 a champ, mm-hmm. was beaten by a four seed, Austin Mandergriff in the first round. Wow. Um, and, uh, on the other side of the brackets, I guess Spring Westfield, another district champion, was knocked out in the first round. So, you know, th- these are four seeds knocking off one seed. That's so, it kind of, if you look big picture, I know neither Plano or Sexton is looking ahead, you know, even to a p- potential head to head matchup. Not looking past, you know, this next round. But if you look big picture, then. Ah, it's open. I mean, that region is open for one of those teams to make a run. We've talked about how low division, you know, uh, region one is. Region two, we talked about being a little bit more accessible as a, as a, as a trip to San Antonio. And, um, you know, it's we're, we're thinking, speaking hypotheticals right now, but that sexy Plano, if they meet up, that winner, I think it'd be considered the favorite to go on. Because Plano uh, has uh, has Ellison up next from the Colleen area, and that's a that's an Ellison very team. bizarre game that was. Yeah, that held. Tr- so, what, yeah, do you know anything about was it like stall ball or whatnot? Because they held Rockwell to just seventeen points, which is well, and, and they they trailed at halftime. Rockwell was ahead eight to seven at the half. <sighs> So, so they slowed it down, but I mean, how many, how many first quarters do you see in eight to seven? Let alone a yeah. half. Because these are with stall ball or just both teams combined to shoot like ten percent from the field. I, I, I think it was yeah. a little bit of both. I think yeah. Rockwall's objective was to slow the game down. Yeah. Um, maybe not to that extent, but yeah, that's that's that floored me when I was going through looking at updates during during the game on Tuesday, and I saw you know Rockwall leads eight to seven at the half. I said, no, nah, that's a misprint. That's a, that's a mistype or something. That's that's after the first quarter. It's early in the first quarter or whatnot. But no, yeah, but they yeah they, they held Rockwell to 17 in the game, and uh, whether it be style or just you know the tempo of the game, that's still impressive. And then Plano Ellison is going to be the second half of a doubleheader um, all the way down in, uh, in Italy, Italy, Texas on uh, on Friday night is the uh, the second half of a, of a Plano ISD versus Colleen ISD doubleheader. The first game will feature Plano East against state ranked Harker Heights. Um, you know this Plano East team, I got to see them on Tuesday in their playoff opener against Wiley, and uh, in one of those games where, um, as we talked about on the podcast, where you're just kind of curious as to how a, a young team like that's going to start. Um, you know, I just think that uh, you know if you if you're a young team that hasn't necessarily been through the battles yet to come with the postseason, that if you have a, a, a you know a bit of a, a bit of a slow start to that very first game, that perhaps maybe a little doubt can creep in, and then you know it can kind of be a bit of a trickle down effect, and the mistakes might compound, and that's kind of how you get upset. Uh, Plano East did not have to worry about that. You no, know, they uh, they jumped on Wiley for a 13 to two lead. Um, you know, despite Wiley's defense doing a fairly good job, you know, limiting Plano's um, you know damage done on its first shot offense, and by that I mean the first shot that they generate out of an offensive set. Um, you know, Sachs had a really, really tough time on the glass. I think Plano East had 10 offensive rebounds in the first quarter alone. Um, you know, Plano East had 
you know, Taylor Hagen, uh, Denavia Hall, um, just really, really effective on the glass. And Plano East just generated so many shots in the in the rim on second chance points, and they got to the free throw line a bunch. Um, and then defensively, they were dialed in. They only held uh, they held widely to just three made field goals in the first half, including none in the second quarter. Wow. Just three free throws were all that Wiley had to show for its efforts. And this was a you know a twenty six to twelve game at the half, and then Plano East was able to get it up to twenty by the end of the third quarter. And I mean, yeah, so they um you know they were able to pass that first uh, you know that first hurdle of the postseason, and now uh, you know we get a chance to see what they can do against Harker Heights. You know, Harker Heights had a bit of a, a bit of a battle on its hands against Rockwell Heath. It was a fairly competitive game for about three three and a half quarters, and then Harker Heights got a little bit of separation, won that one by twelve. Um, but yeah, just a chance for uh, for Plano East to make a bit of a statement. And just when you look at how well they had shown, you know, against the other upper, uh, the other uh, upper echelon teams in this in District Nine Six A, how they took Plano down to the wire in that rematch. They beat Allen once. Um, you know, they were able to beat McKinney, McKinney team that beat a solid Lakeview Centennial team, and it's by district opener. Um, so Plano East has, uh, you know, despite their youth, they've shown that, um, you know, as the season has gone on, they have really begun to realize their identity, and the uh, that talent is really starting to shine through. And it's a team that, you know, if they're able to get over the second half hurdle in one of the tougher teams that they'll have played up to this point of the season, then there's a pathway there for them to potentially maybe get to that regional tournament uh, next week. Um, but the uh, that was not, you know, f- no clue well, that was the, uh, you know, nowhere close to the uh, the most entertaining game that I saw the week because uh, Monday was uh, was a fun little upset out of the out of Grapevine High School. Um, you know, I got to see one of the top ten teams in the state go down. Uh, Keller had a had a rough go against Louisville, the number three seed out of District Six Six A. Um, you know, this was um, I kind of. You know, threw up a uh, kind of a small red flag on uh, on Monday's podcast, just because if there was something that may have thrown you off the scent, it was how Keller looked in that seeding game on Friday against Denton Geyer. You know, um, I mean, they lost that game. What was it? I have it written down here, sixty-four to thirty-nine. And that's Ooh. You know, like, I mean, wait, what? I mean, this is you know, just a, uh, this is a Geyer team that they had just beaten two weeks earlier. And so, Geyer's like, supposed to be ranked number eight, and Keller's supposed to be ranked number nine. Yeah. How do you so, like, how third? yeah, how in two yeah. weeks' time did this game all of a sudden mm. become a you near know, twenty-five point disparity between these two teams? Um, so yeah, that was you know threw up a little bit of a, a little bit of a red flag and whatnot. But then to see these two teams, you know, you just uh, yes, they're warming up. You just kind of get a look and like, okay, I mean, Louisville's the taller team. They're the more athletic team. They're longer. Um, I know the level of defense that they can play. So you know, I, I mean, granted, it was my first look at Keller, so I had no idea what they had. I mean, you learn just right from the opening tip that that I mean, they play a. Uh, just a, a press and a zone defense. It's like they're all collectively on bath salts. I mean, they just, it's so aggressive out there. I mean, it is as fast, like the rotations of that defense are about as fast as any team that I've seen all year. And I mean, it basically forced Louisville into a lot of like hot potato possessions early on, and they just couldn't generate a good shot out of it. They had a really, really tough time protecting the ball, and Keller really kind of pounced on them. But, um, you know, but then Louisville's defense did such a good job of, um, you know, if they weren't, if they were just able to protect the ball and just keep, you know, Keller from getting out in transition, getting some easy buckets, then once you think settle down into more of a half-court game, uh, Keller's half-court offense was relatively non-existent early on, and that's why, you I mean, despite the strong start by Keller... <coughs> You know, Lucille was able to keep this one relatively close to the point where they make a huge push in the second quarter, and they're up. You know, <laughs> poor Devin. Allergies are killing me. I'm sorry. <laughs> poor guy. When, when's your funeral? <laughs> Power through. Uh, so yeah, then it was uh, it was thirty to twenty two. Louisville at the half. They just went on this massive run. Uh, you know, Little Lawrence, their star post, had a monster game: twenty two points, thirteen rebounds. Uh, she just, I mean, there was no answer for her down low. And then you know, but then uh, Keller comes right out of the second half, and you know they crack Louisville with a twelve zero run. So you think, right, okay, momentum's back on Keller's side. Louisville's able to get a little something late in the quarter, and then it's a one point game heading into the fourth, and then it's just back and forth, back and forth, going right down and. Inside the uh, the final 30 seconds, you know it's a tie ball game, 51-51. Keller's trying to run out some clock, presumably take one more shot. Um, while they're just uh, you know kind of throwing the ball around in the backcourt, though, Louisville tries to pressure a little bit. Keller uh, you know throws a pass, and then the uh, the receiver of the pass just fumbles it. Um, Louisville's able to scoop up a loose ball. They go right to the other end. Um, Maya Dotson, just a freshman, she scores over over a uh, Keller defender for uh, for a 53-51 lead with about 51 seconds left. So right then and there, you have this Keller team that has been. Been so effective getting points you know, off
off of turnovers and getting points in transition. So now, okay, you know, when all the chips are on the table, can you uh, can you generate you know one last bucket out of a half court set? Something that you've kind of struggled with all game. And you know, they actually, I mean, they got a fairly open three pointer. So fair play to them on that. But uh, the shot went wide. Louisville got the rebound and was able to you know nurse it to the uh, to the finish line from there. So just like that, you have one of the top ten teams in the state going down in the uh, in the first round. And um, you know, an impressive victory for Louisville. Certainly the the signature win for that program under uh, under head coach Sally Allsbrook. Um, you know, elsewhere you look around and you had um, you know Lake Dallas was able to get its first playoff win in 12 years in a game where they met a little bit of resistance from number four seeded uh, Azel. This is a game that Lake Dallas trailed at the half, 29 to 27, and then they flipped the switch, outscoring by 22 points in the second half. Um, you know, they had. They had been through those battles throughout district play. You think to the uh, the big comeback they had in that rematch with the Colony, where they were able to erase a 15 point deficit in the second half and upset the Lady Cougars on the on the road, I believe. Um, and then you know, I mean, players like Dorian Norris, she was just all all over the place. 22 points, just a myriad of hustle plays. Bailey Broughton, little sophomore point guard for them, she had 17 points. They just have so many weapons. Whether it's you know those two, the the Elliott sisters, Georgia and JoJo, um, there doesn't need to be any one or two players that are clicking. If not, if there's two that are you know that are having an off night then you know that two more are going to step up it's a really really uh, nice luxury that that team has and yeah for the first time in over a decade they're on to the second round um, and then you had the colony which survived a really really game effort from uh, from grapevine 54 to 50 uh, you know their two star players jewel spear Tamia jones they combined for 37 points spear really came alive there in the fourth quarter she had 12 of the team's 15 points over those last eight minutes including a go-ahead three-pointer inside the final 30 seconds um, and they just they got just enough defensively from the uh, from the role players, Araya Cotto, Haley Courtney, to name a couple, um, to hold off Grapevine. And um, it's just, you know, just uh, another year, another playoff run. This is the fourth straight year that they've advanced out of that out of that uh, first round. And, you know, uh, beware of the colony at your own peril. It's a very, very deceptive three seed, as we alluded to on the uh, on the podcast, just when you factor in just the top shelf talent of, uh, of those top two players for them. So, um, I don't know, Brian, your, uh, your game on Monday, uh, first goal Lone Star against McKinney North, a chance to, you know, perhaps one of the more competitive games on paper between those, uh, you know, those two districts. Um, what was your takeaway from that as, uh, as Lone Star was able to get a pretty impressive victory? Obviously, North has, you know, the two studs, you know, Mario Fields and Chelsea Wooten. And, man, they, they kept them in check for the most part. I, I, Mario Fields, I believe, finished with 18 points. Um, but she took 18 shots. Yeah. You know, she was 6 for 18. You know, she's taking tough shots. She went on a little hot streak where she went on a 6-0 run by herself in the second quarter, made things interesting. But they Lone Star defense really put the clamps on them, you know, coming out of the half. And, and the, the entire second half – yeah, Lone Star was never able to really, really pull away by, you know, more than what I believe it was 12 points or so, but it was never really in doubt. You know, mm-hmm. the North, McKinney North kind of got in between five and six at one point. They got a couple buckets here and there, but I, I was never like in my head thinking, oh man, Lone Star is about to blow this game because really outside of, you know, Amari Fields, no one, they, they were missing a lot of threes, first of all. Like they were, North, their role players weren't stepping up, you know, like they need to in a playoff game. They only scored 39 points. Mm-hmm. And when Amaria Fields is shooting six for 18 and your role players are are missing open jumpers and Lone Stars, you know, forcing contested jumpers and not letting them get, you know, points in the paint like they were in the first quarter of that game, you know, it's, it's going to be tough. And Kyla Deck, she was the best player on the floor. Lone Stars, you know, star guard. She had 22 points. Um, she filled up the stat sheet and, and, and more than just scoring. I mean, she was awesome. I thought she would that, – in that game, she was better than Amaria Fields. But I think Lone Star's job defensively on fields, really making it a point of emphasis to make her take tough shots, uh, especially in that second half. I mean, she was heaving up some, some – I, I don't want to say bad threes, but it was just contested threes. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it was more of a testament Just of, that of you'll Lone live Star. with if you're the opposing uh, Of course. And if she's hitting those, then Lone Star, all you got to do is just tip your hat. For sure. Um, and, and like I said, in the first half, she went through a little streak where she was making some stuff where it's like, man, this Mario Fields girl is really good, <laughs> which she is. Um, but, you know, Lone Star made her, her life you know, pretty tough in that second half, and, and Lone Star advances. Um, Centennial, um, they also defeated Wiley East, the four seed, defeating uh, the one seed um, in that district. And so, you know, three of the nine 5A teams advance, the one that I, you know, one that I thought would advance didn't advance. <laughs> um, I actually thought it would be a sweep. Can't get them all through, Brian. I know. I know. I'm being too greedy. I thought it was going to be a sweep, mm-hmm. honestly. 
I was worried a little bit about Lone Star North because North has the you know the high powered offense. They just scored seventy three points in the season finale oh, yeah. against Lovejoy. Yeah. You know, a team that, you know, gave Liberty all they could handle for about two and a half quarters. For sure. Um but yeah, and the, the biggest surprise, like I mentioned earlier, was Memorial, uh, and I wasn't. Su- I, I, I'm not surprised Centennial beat Wiley's, Obviously, the margin. I, I, yeah, I'm surprised they beat them by 22 points. Yeah. Uh, one guy who is plenty well versed with all that uh, Frisco ISD girls basketball has to offer is the Liberty head girls basketball coach Ross Reedy, and we're going to bring him on just a moment to talk about their win on uh, on Tuesday over Lovejoy and uh, just kind of a look at their season in general. And we will do that after a quick break. All right, and we are back, and uh, we have another special guest this week, uh, Frisco Liberty girls head basketball coach Ross Reedy, our first Frisco guest, and, you know, it's only fitting. You know, we're here at Kelly's uh, Craft Tavern here in Frisco off Preston, and, you know, we have our first Frisco guest. It's Coach Reedy with Liberty. Thanks for thanks for hopping on our third-ever remote podcast. Appreciate you guys having me. So um, it, it's, it's only fitting that we also have you on, you know, you know, given the, the state championship run or near state championship run y'all made last year and, you know, middle of the playoffs, just got going this week. Um, y'all beat Lovejoy, but for, what happened, first of all, Lovejoy? I mean, the final score, y'all beat them pretty good, but what happened in that first quarter? Well, yeah, the final score was for, uh, definitely misleading. I mean, uh, you know, it was 53 to 33, but at the same time, uh, it, you know, it was four points going in the fourth quarter. Uh, but early, they, they just do a good job. Uh, Coach Boxall over at Lovejoy is always, I mean, he, he's really well known for, uh, well, when he comes from a basketball family, but he's also really well known for just being a guy that gets his guy, uh, kids to play at a really high level, often beyond their ability. And uh, and also he's great for schemes, and uh, we knew that we were going to have to get some uh, people in some of their soft spots of their zone, which we did early, and we just weren't knocking down some shots, and so um, it, we were actually we weren't upset with the looks that we were getting in the first quarter. Obviously, we were upset with uh, you know how they they weren't going in the going in the hoop, and you know unfortunately we could get off to a good start in the second quarter, uh, sparked by some of our pressure and um, a couple of good plays by Zoe Junior. But no. It, it's frustrating not to see the ball go in, but you look at your execution. You, you try not to uh, coach or make emotional decisions based off of results. You, you look at uh, you know, how you're getting those looks, and, uh, and, and we were really confident that we would continue to get some good looks, and maybe we need to spark ourselves with a little bit of um, pressure, but we, we weren't too upset. And a lot of those good looks were from Jazzy Owens Barnett, your, your top scorer, top playmaker this year. You, brought a, you mentioned a good comparison to her, and me and Matt even talked about this, you know, <laughs> a good quote you you gave me after the game you compared some of the shots she was making to something rip hamilton would make you know how how special has she been and you know that kind of other you know that that kind of segues me into another question you know you lost you know a lot of your pretty much your entire roster from last year that that played significant minutes that went to state last year and you have a brand new roster jazzy owens coming off as a six man now as your top player you know first talk about how you know important she's been this year and what it's been like to know have a brand new roster and still win the district and be as dominant as y'all have been well, you, you, we use the word dominant loosely. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, our wins, I mean, we won a double overtime uh, against Lone Star the How first time. Game, yeah. yeah, of course, uh, the first time through. Uh, we barely, uh, you know, come away with a five-point win at, at Memorial. We uh, win by one against Centennial once uh, and then another eight-point game. And, I, and I'm sure that there was a couple of other close ones along the way. And so, you know, really, you know, you first mentioned Jazzy, and she's um, – been a heck of a player and a heck of a leader. I mean, really, we've I've never put so much on uh, a player ever in my career in terms of uh, just – so much of the load, not just in terms of what happens on the court, but uh, really her and Maya Jane have kind of uh, taken on leadership roles, and we've never really had to have asked that of somebody that's 15 years old. So even more of a like a Rebecca Lasky or Jordan Hamilton, I guess, because uh, you had two of them at the same time. Two of them at the same time, yeah. and they had juniors and seniors above them, and so I mean we had a long list. And one of the reasons we could do so well for as long as we did is because we had people carrying the torch, and uh, Rebecca Lasky and uh, Jordan Hamilton had Allie Elliott, Majesty Robinson, uh, uh, Caleb. Monday, a number of people to learn from, and really with, with just a short time, Jazzy Owen Barnett had with that senior class, you know, for her to, to kind of turn that corner as a leader has been really special. Obviously, she's, uh, you know, 
done really well on the court. Um, and then as far as, you know, how it's looked for us, uh, you know, losing nine seniors and coming out and, and winning a district championship, we've been really, really fortunate. Uh, our girls maybe learned a little bit sooner than some of uh, their counterparts that, uh, you know, just – they love each other. They work really, really well together. Uh, it's a lot of selfless basketball and, uh, and, and also some fortune uh, because, you know, maybe we got some people not playing their best uh, when they got to see us, which was uh, which helped us. I wanted to uh, just ask a question about your defense because that's been just such a constant during this run of y'alls. Um, just what goes into getting the buy-in from your players when it comes to the defensive end of the floor? Just because I feel like you got to be wired a certain way to really be willing to, you know, kind of go all out on that end. Yeah, you, you do have to be wired a certain way. You have to be wired to want to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I say that because you're not going to get on the court f for a Red Hawk basketball team if you can't play defense. It doesn't matter. You know, you're going to offensively, and the, the idea behind that is offensively, you're going to have nights where you go off and you're going to have nights. I mean, Jazzy Owens, you mentioned that uh, she, she made a couple of jump shots the other day. And you mentioned Rip Hamilton that that she in high school basketball players of any kind don't have any business making and she made them back to back she came over the top of a screen and hit a big time jumper she crosses over actually goes the wrong way in a transition bucket and hits a fade away fall away in the in the left uh, deep left short corner like those things don't happen every night you know it's actually kind of scary because she starts off the season scoring 28 against uh, uh, Mansfield Timberview and uh, she hit a couple of those tough shots well that doesn't happen every night well what you can control every night is playing great defense of filling your tank on that end you know being a you know putting some sand in your teeth grit you know being gritty being tough doing that together and plus that exemplifies what you're trying uh, to do as a squad anyway you you, you know it's not a one-on-one -on -one kind of situation you didn't score one man didn't score in one man it, it's a collective group thing and it's a great way to build our identity we did it 10 you know when uh, coach Mooneyham Harrison took over 10 years ago that's what we what we aimed to do was to kind of build it off of the defensive mentality and, and that's a, been a big part of our culture and so kids know when they come in we don't care what you did in middle school we don't care you know how well you shoot the three-pointer or whatever are you going to play defense are you going to sell out for your teammates and uh and that is a contagious thing it, it's tough at first mm -hmm. but once that you know kind of gets embedded in the kids it, it's something they take a lot of pride in and you were able to parlay that into another district championship and doing so in a 10-team district um what has it been like these last couple of years getting acclimated to a uh, an 18 game district schedule versus what you'd seen in the past no it's uh you know at first it took some getting used to just because you're starting district right after thanksgiving and thankfully the uil looked out for us and uh they did Oh, no. Okay, we're back in that 10-team district. I forgot. Uh, so we're going to have 18 uh, well, games. No that, yeah, there for right, a right, right. No, we're going to have 18 yeah. games the next two years. But, no, it takes some getting used to because you start so early. And that's the only unfortunate thing is that mm -hmm. you have to be ready in November. And you would like to continue to problem solve, build chemistry, try to figure some things out, especially with the young team. One of the reasons we were able to go 16-2 and two is I don't think that we're any better than some of the teams in our district. In fact, I kind of see us as kind of the fourth or fifth best team. Um, but but everybody's young. And so Memorial was young. Lone Star was young. Reedy is young. And, uh, and I'm leaving out somebody. Centennial's Centennial is probably the most yeah. veteran squad. Mm -hmm. um, but they have some new pieces. And, uh, and I think we kind of figured it out a little bit earlier. But, no, it's tough because, you you know, having to be ready in November, you know, especially when we're, we pride ourselves in playing our best basketball January, February, and hopefully early March is, uh, is, a, tall, is a tall order for anyone. And so, but other than that, you kind of get into the groove of things. It does make for a taxing season. I know a lot of people get tired. And you got to have a you know a, a, a great competitive stamina, which is a lot to ask for anyone, uh, especially you know uh, uh, some young people. Before we ask you about you know South Oak Cliff, who you play tomorrow night in the area round, you mentioned Memorial, and you know they have one of the top players in the district, same age, top uh, players in the state. She's amazing. She is she is awesome. Average, averages over twenty points a game. Jasmine Lott, you know, and that Memorial team is the, is the real deal. What you know your your former assistant is the head coach there, Rochelle, Rochelle Vaughn. Man, what kind of what do you think happened against? Denison in the first round. Real, I was surprised. Yeah, I, I was. Yeah. I, if, if, there, if you'd asked me if there was a guarantee win coming out of uh, even playing at Denison, if there was a guarantee win coming out of our district, I would have said Memorial. In fact, uh, next to Red Oak, who's the most talented team in the region, uh, I would have said that Memorial's my my next favorite to be at the uh, be at the regional final. And uh, and uh, 
and I, but it comes down to a few things. You know, obviously, you have to have your kids ready, which I know Coach Vaughn did. Uh, but you know, sometimes matchups will play a role. Dennison's awfully talented. They got a big, which you don't see all the time. It's all, you know, seeing somebody with a big these days is like in football seeing going against uh, the wishbone. Nobody sees the wishbone anymore, and so now when you you that's why Navy will beat somebody every year, or um, you know, one of I'm, I'm trying to think of all the different Air Force will beat somebody every year that they're not supposed to beat because now everybody's playing spread. Well, everybody's four or five guards these days, and so now when you see a true big, that can be taxing, uh, or that can be tough, you know, a difficult kind of matchup. And then on top of that, um, there, uh, Denison did a really good job from what you know, from everything I've heard in terms of not turning the ball over because Memorial can go can get on you quickly, and they can get in the spurts. They're a very emotional team, and you know when they ride high, they can ride really, really hot, and. Uh, you know, when, when Dennison turned the ball over, they either threw it out of bounds or they took a 10-second call, so they didn't hurt themselves. They got a chance to set back up on defense, and um, which was probably critical to their success. And then on top of that, you get a you get an early lead, and you got the emotion going your way, and you're playing at home. Uh, it's, it's it's tough to overcome. Now, sock, how how tough of a of a second round matchup, you know, is that going to be tomorrow night? Yeah, that's uh, it's it's super tough, and it's really fun, you know. And we've kind of been in this situation several times. I, I think back to the first time I was on the girls' side, we played Dallas Lincoln, who was the number two team in the state of Texas at the time in 2010, 2011, and we saw them in the second round because we got second in district, and um, and. Of course, they went on to the state semifinal where they got beat by uh, uh, Austin LBJ, but. We've seen these matchups a lot. We saw Sock last year. They, uh, you know, a heck of a team. And Keelan Jones is a friend of mine, and he always has them ready to play. Uh, they're more talented than us at four or five positions, um, and, and and so it's we're going to have a it's, it's a tall order for us, but it's a fun order because you get to get out there and you don't when you know when you're a little kid you don't think about. Uh, Playing a bunch of you know people that you plan on beating by fifty and sixty in the big time games, you plan on playing the very best, and we get an opportunity to do that early on. Uh, they're going to present some challenges with their physicality, you know. But our kids, uh, we we've seen it all year. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons we make the schedule as tough as we make the schedule, and so it, it, it's really exciting. Uh, but it's also really tough, and so we got to be playing our best basketball. Before we let you go. We've got to bring up one thing. I know we've talked about it before, but I want to talk about it on the podcast since we have you on. Last year, the Randy Thompson shot mm-hmm. in the regional final against Lone Star, and then you're in the, you know, Randy's going nuts. She's doing some weird dance move looking thing, and you have your arms out like, are you not entertained? Wait, do you, you know, what what was your, what was going through your head in that moment, and what did you think when you saw that picture? Because I believe you texted me, you know, that weekend or the next day or something. You're like, man, dude, that's an awesome picture. I think I even had Coach Womble reach out to yeah. me, wanted that picture too. What, what, talk me through that whole play there yeah I, well before i talked to you about the play the picture wasn't that awesome I mean, there's a there's an <laughs> aging fat guy with sweat stains i mean because of your sweat no, stains i actually want to thank you because because of that <laughs> picture i've lost 33 pounds uh, uh shame, yeah shameless plug really <laughs> um but yeah so thank you for that picture uh in a sense gotten a lot of negative uh feedback uh on twitter i was trolled uh you know relentlessly but anyway so um <laughs> I uh, no, that was you know that's just a great player making a play. You know the, it's funny when people come up to you. A lot of times you get too much credit as a coach, and they they were like, hey, you know everything that you did in the playoffs, like you know all that you in so many situations that came up, and your kids were executing. You you had a heck of a run, and I was like, guys, you know if only knew what was going on in the huddle. What was going on in the huddle is I was looking at KK Lay, who was a, a heck of a player. We miss her. Uh, as I was going, hey KK, what do you want to do? You know what what do you see out there? Because you get to you know, you start to have that kind of relationship, especially with KK, who we coached for four years on varsity, to where you know what they were seeing. Well, anyway, in that particular situation, we were hoping they didn't foul us because that was going to put us on the line. And uh, we were just trying to get the ball back around to Randy with her movement going forward, her body going forward. We try to get a cheap little look with Mara Casey. If we, we try to get Kyla Deck, uh, who was a freshman then, who would get caught up defensively uh, a few times. We thought that we might get her missed in a switch and get an, a three from somebody that the, they didn't anticipate. We actually barely Barely got the ball in bounds. Some people say we got away with the travel. I'm one of them, um, and uh, with uh, with Alyssa and I or anyway. But but the ball did get back around to uh, Randy. Her her weight was going forward. Uh, one of their players kind of um, uh, so it, in a sense indirectly it was 
you know, a little bit how we drew it up. And then one of their players got caught up going for a ball that they shouldn't have, and it gave Randy some space. And Randy doesn't need a lot of space. She's doing a heck of a job at North Texas this year. Uh, yeah, after a little bit of a slow start. And I know that they're trying to get some stuff together, but uh, that kid can compete like nobody I've seen, seen before. And so when that ball was shot, I actually was right behind her. And I was actually thinking, like, oh, my God, that, that's going to go. And so when it went um, – you know, I, I didn't. I want to be Larry Bird. That's who I want to be. I want to be Joe Lombard in high school. I want to be Larry Bird. I want to have no reaction and that cool. But let's just be real. I'm not that cool. So I uh, threw my hands out, and I'm sure my dad was saying, "What a cocky jerk." <laughs> but uh, but it, but it wasn't intentional. Well, who would have thought that the Randy Thompson shot would have helped you lose 33 pounds? So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Thanks, Randy. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. Well, so tomorrow night, so Friday night at Arl Turner, uh, Liberty versus South Oak Cliff in the area around. I will be there. I'll, I will have all your updates. Uh, you can check me on Twitter at Brian Murphy underscore Coach Reedy. Thanks for uh, hopping on the pod, and uh, see you again tomorrow night. I appreciate you guys having me. Thanks appreciate a lot. It, Coach. Yep. Best of luck tomorrow. I right, appreciate it. And we are back. Big thanks to Ross Reedy of Frisco Liberty for taking the time to join us on the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast. We're going to keep this thing going from out here at Kelly's Craft Tavern here in Frisco. Once again, obviously, big thanks to Kelly's for having us out for once a, uh, another episode of the podcast. Um, if you have not had a chance to swing by this fine establishment, please do so. Everything from uh, from, a, from craft beers at a full-service bar to made-from-scratch food, barbecue, Tex-Mex, all sorts of good stuff. Bound to be something on that menu that you'll dig. So, um, <laughs> Kelly's Craft Tavern, located at Preston. Ridge on the west side of Preston Road, just north of 121. And again, big thanks to them for hosting this episode of the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast. So um, we have given some reactions to what we saw from the first round of the girls' basketball playoffs. So um, yeah, obviously next week is when the action on the boys' side begins. So let's do just kind of a cursory look at, um, at what's in store there. Now we'll do our full-fledged uh, playoff preview for boys' basketball on Monday, uh, but just a little bit of an appetizer to just kind of set the, set the, uh, set the stage for what is, uh, what is on the horizon rising there let's um let's start by talking about a team that uh they they freaking did it guys a perfect regular season for old carrollton newman smith the trojans, the trojans pulled it off 27 and 0 they polished off an undefeated season regular season i should say um on tuesday with a blowout of woodrow wilson a game that just fits part and parcel with every other game that they played during their district 11 5a schedule they go 14 and 0 in district play no game was closer than 15 points they have not played a game that was, you know, you could call close since December 20th. So as we now uh, look ahead to the postseason, that's going to kind of be the uh, the big question for this team is, all right, well, what happens then when they do finally get into a close game for the first time? Because it's going to happen, obviously. It's, uh, you know, maybe not in the first round when they draw Samuel, a team that yeah. you'd expect on paper they're probably going to run over just like, uh, you know, they have the rest of their uh, of their district. But then you look ahead to that second round, you know, perhaps they get a rematch with McKinney North, the team that has plenty of history with, of, you know, is the, uh, the North team that knocked them out last year and whatnot. Obviously a little bit of a different look to North than, uh, than last season's team, but um, no, no, uh, no lack of history there. Could draw Frisco Centennial in a matchup, but um, but yes, just um, interesting to see kind of what uh, what's in store for this Newman Smith team. Is now um, now it's for real. Now they get a chance to see what they can turn this uh, this perfect regular season into. Um, you know, as we talked about you know, on a previous podcast, they do have the advantage at least of being on the opposite end of the Region Two Five A bracket from Lancaster, you know, the number one ranked team in the state. And you know, if they are able to make a uh, you know a run to the regional tournament and draw Lancaster, then that's I mean. No no matter the result, that's still an incredible season for them. This is not a team that's ever been to the regional tournament. So a chance for, uh, for Newman Smith to make a little bit of history after already having you know done something that is a, a pretty rare accomplishment to just to pull off 27-0, and no matter the schedule, to not get tripped up one time. And they did play a lot of 6A competition during the preseason. Um, a very, very impressive feather in the cap for head coach Percy Johnson and his, uh, and his bunch. I mean, imagine if they do beat Lancaster. I saw Lone oh, Star yeah. beat Lancaster no. in the regional. <laughs> <laughs> but just imagine. <laughs> Just imagine death in this new. No, it can, team, it can happen. It can happen. This I, Newman I, Smith team looks better than Lone Star yeah. was last year. I mean, it could. I mean, granted, Lancaster is taking the next step, but they're beatable. Yeah, I mean, no, they're, they're. I mean, anybody's beatable in a given sure. night. I, I mean, like I say, I just having seen Lancaster play this season, they're they're just the best team you've seen. They're on oh yeah, show, without okay. without a doubt. And that, granted, I haven't seen a lot of the, the some of the six A powers. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen Duncanville or some of those guys. But you know that that Lancaster team is just so deep. But again. Like you say, Newman Smith, not just the fact that they went undefeated, that, I mean, the confidence level has to be Absolutely. sky high right now. They, they've they got to go into every game, even if they play Lancaster, thinking, hey, we're undefeated. We can, be, we can win this game. Oh, yeah. 
Um, Brian, what do you see, and I guess um, some initial thoughts on just the bi-district matchups with the four Frisco schools. Um, they draw District 10-5A. Um, you have, uh, you know, as far as how 10-5A finished up, you got a bit of an obscure pick at uh, number one as Princeton was able to win that district. Princeton, who, um, you know, by the, uh, the Texas Association of Basketball Coaches, wasn't even picked to make the playoffs at the start of the season. <laughs> and then they go and haul off a 9-1 and record in district play. And, I mean, yeah, so a fairly convincing district championship for the, uh, for the Tigers, for the Panthers, I should say. That's the college. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, so what do you, um, you kind of see on Frisco's end as far as uh, a bit of a different uh, order of, uh, than we're accustomed to from Frisco ISD and boys basketball? Yeah, how about Wakeland winning a, a district title? You know, going down to, the, down to the wire Tuesday night against Independence, that was a 75-69 game. You know, that, and it's not soccer. <laughs> I don't, like, how, how do you think the risk of Frisco ISD must feel seeing that, oh, another sport that Wakeland <laughs> is, a, yeah. is the district champion in? How about the year for independence just all together? You know, yeah. they're, they're like just in athletics, they're, they're kind of rival. You know, I remember last year I did a Lone Star, Wakeland, and the Reedy was thrown in there a bit. But this, it's a lot more even this time around. You know, it seems like Independence and Centennial, they're, they're really showing out. And what do you know, Independence and Centennial, they're in the playoffs. Uh, on the boys' side, um, two teams that weren't in the playoffs last year. You know, they were mm-hmm. towards the bottom uh, of the barrel last year. Um, Frisco, they're back in the playoffs. They have to play Princeton. I don't know what to make of that because, I, one, I was surprised to see Princeton, like you said, win the district. They went 9-1. and one, mm-hmm. But a lot of their games were close against the Lovejoys, against the Wiley East, against the Shermans, yeah. just like Frisco. Mm-hmm. Man, that – there was five or six teams that could have won the Frisco district. So there's not – yeah, Wakeland, you know, they, they took care of business. They finished 14-4. and four. They won the district. They might have a district MVP uh, in Cooper Cisco. We'll see. Um, but, I mean, nothing will surprise me. I, I'm not going to sit here and say anything's going to upset or anything's a lock because mm-hmm. there is no lock. I, I mean, on the girls' side, there were some locks. I'm, None of these matchups would surprise me if they win either way. Let's see. For the bi-district matchups between 9-6-A and 10-6-A, we have, uh, let's see, we have Allen, who won the district for, um, for 9-6-A. They still don't know who their opponent's going to be because Gar- uh, Garland and South Garland have a, uh, have a play-in game on Friday. Man, like, I was, I was so looking forward to the possibility of maybe getting Allen and South Garland last year. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we could, you know, to get to see Ty- uh, you know, Tyrese Maxey and Chris Harris go up against Isaiah Stevens and that whole bunch. And, you know, we could get it this year, albeit under a very, very different set of circumstances. Um, but um, but yes, where South Garland has very much reloaded behind some really promising underclassmen. Allen, I mean, um, it is. you wonder how motivated that team is going to be for this postseason because they, um, I mean, for the second straight year, I think last year they ended, the reg- they ended the regular season with just three losses. This year, just four losses. And then, um, but it was all for naught. I mean, they got, a, you know, they got bounced in the second round by Colleen Shoemaker. Um, you know, they won't... Uh, I believe only one school from Colleen ISD made the playoffs on the uh, on the boys' side. But nevertheless, if you're Allen, though, I mean, it's a team that has, I mean, they're, they're coming off their first outright district championship since 1992. They went undefeated in district. I mean, it's all the confidence in the world in the team that is playing with the swagger of a, you know, of a, of a program that's, you know, that should theoretically be able to get on a run. But it's just like, as you saw last year, once you get past that, you know, that first hurdle, then, you know, once you start playing those teams from Central and South Texas, it's just there's a little bit of, a, you know, some unknowns that get thrown in there so it will, again we'll see i mean i you know this allen team is um it's it does check a lot of boxes you know they there there were times early in the season where you know perhaps they were a little bit prone to some slow first quarters but they've you know they kind of ironed that out a bit you know ty elder manny obaseki bryce kennedy their three uh you know their three anchors are all playing with just uh Again, just a world of confidence, and you know the uh, the big matchup that's um, you know you look through the bracket that um, you know folks will have circled as a potential matchup between them and uh, Colleen Ellison, who's right there with Allen in the top five in the state rankings. Um, you know, but again, you threw out all these scenarios. You know, last year with you know you could get oh you know Allen and Jesuit or South Garland or whoever, and then you ended up getting I, I forget what the regional final wound up being, but it was two teams that just at least up in the Dallas area was just was not even remotely close to you know being on that radar. So who knows? Weird things can happen. Yeah, um, but don't don't look past that first round game. Oh yeah, that, that's the, it's either South Carolina or Garland. They're both really young teams. Fresh, sure. I mean, South Carolina is built around. I mean, Just McBride and T.J. Brown are both freshmen, mm-hmm. and they're hardly their two best players. Two of the four certainly. Uh, Just McBride's a six five kid that gives people matchup problems. He can hit the three. He can play mm-hmm. down low. Uh, and Garland's young too, uh, with uh, Zuby Edgefor. Um, he's a, a big kid, six seven inside. So they create some matchup problems. Um, you know, with teams now. Granted, Allen's going to be the prohibitive favorite, and I fully expect Allen to move on no because doubt. with with that in, with that youth becomes uh, you know inexperienced. Um, 
But, you know, it's just one of those things you mentioned, Allen getting bounced in the second round last year. They can't afford to look, overlook anybody. And I think they'll be fresh on their minds having that early exit Absolutely. last year, you know, going forward. Let's see. You look at the other matchups. Um, I was curious. So McKinney draws Lakeview Centennial in a matchup um, that uh, is, I guess, uh, the same thing that happened on the girls' side. So we'll see if, uh, you know, if McKinney can make a 2-0 and versus the Patriots. I'm dubbing McKinney versus Lakeview Centennial the Kendrick Johnson Bowl. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's it got Kendrick written all over yeah, his alma mater and his coverage area. The team so. that he covers versus Alma Water. Where do you think Kendrick's loyalties would lie in a matchup between McKinney and Lakeview Centennial? McKinney. McKinney, you think yeah, so? He's, he's fully invested in McKinney ISD. <sighs> I mean, he, he talks all this smack about McKinney North with Frisco I have to do with me, so I mean, of course. Uh, yeah, but he's never really had a chance to uh, wax poetic on Lakeview. I mean, he's we it doesn't really Lakeview. If, if anybody talks about Lakeview, it's me just because it's in my coverage areas, and it's we haven't had a lot of McKinney Lakeview matchups, no doubt, uh, in the until this you know the last couple of weeks. So um, I don't know. I'd be interested to see where his loyalties lie truly, because I think the old patriot in him might come out. Uh, it does seem like he does at least like as far as like he'll ask the kind of how Lakeview. He's doing. He'll make references on the podcast that he went there. Whereas versus like in college, like you wouldn't know that Kendrick played basketball at North Texas. He's completely disassociated. Oh with yeah, that, yeah. That yeah which is no, no, he's, 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 he's bandwagoning that out. Yeah. But but this but this is also his sport, yeah. basketball. So he may be more partial to the mm-hmm. Lakeview basketball team because that's where he honed his craft. <laughs> I'm a little offended he doesn't bring up you know, the Mean Green as much yeah. as I do because <laughs> I was there for four years. Well, I went to UT, so I don't bring up the basketball at all. Mm-hmm. So yeah, <laughs> that's a good segue though. <laughs> so, so Kendrick, he went to Lakeview. They're playing McKinney. Mm. I graduated from Saxe. They're playing Prosper. Uh-huh. <laughs> and Where did I your loyalties you lie, Brian? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> flip a coin. Whoever wins, I'm on the bandwagon. I, I don't. I don't know. You know, Saxe. What they're in the sec- they're in the playoffs for the second year in a row yeah. after never making the playoffs. Mm-hmm. You know, at well least. they they've made it. It had been six years, I believe, so since they made it last. Yeah. But. Well, at least especially compared to their other sports, where yeah, the yeah. champs and everything. Yeah, boys basketball has been kind of the outlier. They've been consistent playoff teams in basically every other sport. But you know, Zach Mikesell, our star local media coach of the year last year, turning that program around. Uh, has, has done a great job. Um, Obi Onaya is one of the best players in the district. Uh, Dylan McKee and Omari Smith had a big night the other night. I mean, they had to win that game against Damon Forrest uh, on Tuesday night, or else they would have been part of the three-way tie with Garland and South uh, for the final two spots. They all split through the regular season, mm-hmm. so that you'd have one of those crazy uh, tournaments probably on Friday or Thursday, Friday type mm-hmm. thing uh, to decide it, but uh, they took matters into their own hands. Um, you know, they're the three seed going against a, a very good Prosper team. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so I, I guess just on seeding alone, they're going to be the underdog. Uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, that's, how's, how's Prosper been? Are they? You think they're peaking right now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially after that, you know, getting that win and the, and the rematch against McKinney and. <laughs> I think Prosper is the best team that I cover. Yeah. I mean, really. I mean, they're ranked in 6A. What are they, 21? They're 21st in 6A. They're 26 and 6. They have a 20 points per game guy, Mondo Battle. They have a big man in Austin Atkinson, sharpshooter in Amon Allen. You know, Coach Jonathan Ellis is, is one of the best around. I mean, it would be a shocker if they lost this game. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're one of my two state ranked teams. And they're a shocker. They, a shocker. Hear that, Coach Mike? Still hear that, Sexy? A shocker, I if got, y'all want. I got From you, an Coach alumni. Ellis. Alumnus right here. It's been like 10 years. <laughs> I mean, uh, eh. And then I, I kind of want to close this out, an interesting tidbit. My only other state-ranked boys team mm-hmm. on the UIL side, not the private school side, is Salina. Okay. They're, you know, they're mm-hmm. ranked number 16th in, in 4A. They're going to play Pinkston. They don't have to play Lincoln like they did last year. Oh. <laughs> They're not going to draw the four seed from a district that also happens to be ranked like number 10 in the state. (laughs) Yeah, like that was so weird. Um, But if they can get through Pinkston and then they can get through the area around, they could potentially play number two Carter in the third round. And that would be uh, something to keep an eye on, something juicy. happening over there in 4A. Awesome. It all gets rolling on uh, on Monday. And yes, that is a look at, um, a cursory look at what is in store in the boys basketball playoffs. Obviously, we will touch on just about everybody else that we didn't get to um, on Monday when we do our full-fledged preview and whatnot. Um, but yeah, and that'll uh, that'll wrap it up from out here at Kelly's Craft Tavern here in Frisco. Um, yes, we'll be back on Monday to, uh, I guess, yes, yeah, we'll break down the, the full-scale boys basketball playoff picture and um, yeah, just see what's in store. It is, it is basketball postseason time, gentlemen. I love this time of year. Um, So yes, until then, folks, you enjoy the rest of your week and we will talk to y'all later.